is the Church of Scientology so afraid of? This, this is, is SPTV. Welcome back, everybody, for some more SPTV. A.A. Ron is here, and Zach Morgan is here with us. How's it going, Zach? I'm good. It's your attorney friend, Zach Morgan. It's my attorney friend, Zach Morgan. It feels like the perfect way to say your name and introduce you to the world. Um, okay, so let's do a little bit of analysis on day three of the Danny Masterson trial. Here's my question. H how much of the goings on of today have you already uh, read or watched or anything? I, I don't I don't read anything. There's some there's not a lot of written sources that I trust out there on this, but I've seen all the stuff that you've posted. OK, OK, so. Uh, let's let's start with some small potatoes. <laughs> Five minutes before lunchtime, the defense says uh, uh, the 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 uh, the prosecution rests. It's no more questions. Uh, defense is ready to cross examine, and the defense goes, "Your Honor, we just want to begin after lunch." And then she gets ready to like dismiss everybody, and then Sean, Sean Holly goes, "Actually, Your Honor, I'd like to take the five minutes." And Without a beat, the judge was like, okay, call, call in the witness. And and, I, and I'm looking at my watch, and I'm like, it's five minutes right now. The jury's not in the room. The witness isn't in the room. This is a joke. So by the time everyone gets settled, there's two minutes until lunchtime. And Sean, Sean Hollis asks questions for like three minutes. What in the world is going on there? <laughs> Uh, they don't, the, she wants, she did not want the jury to take a 90 minute lunch break and just sit and ponder the, the last set of direct questions. Just as simple as that. Yeah. It's, it's that simple. It's, it's a control thing. It's sort of like when you have kids that get mouthy, like I'm going to get the last word. If it means I have to knock you into next week to do it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's more of a principle thing. It, it wasn't about developing any material evidence. It was just, I don't want the jury having listened to this lady sort of, um, unrebuked for the better part of two days now so i'm going to say something to at least redirect the conversation hmm. interesting trial strategy. yeah it's just a trial strategy it's pretty common okay um okay so the other thing there was a few things here i said i wanted uh to ask you about okay spending an exceedingly an exceeding amount of time i'm not even sure that's the right way to use that word an excessive amount of time there it is on minor details that do not, at least to me, appear to impact the credibility of the witness, uh, uh, any any belief in the minds of the jurors as to whether the actual attacks occurred or did not occur. Things like, um, was he holding your arms down with his left hand, right hand on right hand, or left hand on right hand, or um, were your arms at a 90 degree angle? I mean, is, is this just to fluster the witness? Is this What's going? Why? What? What is with this? You know, so there's there's a variety of ways to cross examine witnesses. Um, and to be honest, as an attorney, one of one of my simple joys in life, other than a, a good scotch and a, and a solid round of golf, is 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 a good cross examination. There's it's one of my few uh, few uh, true joys in life is annihilating a witness. The problem is you don't get to annihilate this witness. You yeah. can't. She's been well prepared. Sounds like she's changed. I don't want to say changed her testimony, but changed the way she presents it. And she's been um, coached correctly that I don't know is a better answer than I think. I don't really care mm. what you think. You either know it or you don't. It's okay that you don't know it. It happened several decades ago um, during a period in which you may or may not have been under the influence of, a, of you know, a substance in your drink or something. So I don't know is a perfectly valid answer. In fact, I would argue it's more accurate than I think or I'm not sure. Right. You either know something or you don't. I call it the pregnancy test. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're not sort of pregnant. You're not kind of pregnant. You either are or you are not. So right. um, she has to do something. She can't sit up there and pass the witness and not ask a question. And sometimes it's a fishing expedition. I'm going to ask some questions. And if I can get the wiggle, if I can get the witness to wiggle the way I need her to, maybe I can run down this rabbit hole. But it sounds like the testimony was, was fairly secure. And at the end of the day, that law firm's probably getting paid by the hour. So they're going to put in. Um, a lot of effort as they should. I mean, they have an ethical obligation to do everything they can to discredit witnesses. I mean, that, that's their job, regardless of whether we like it or not. So she had to do something. She can't just sit there and, and, and you know, rest on her laurels. Yeah. One of the most entertaining parts of Jane Doe 3's, uh, the way she ha has been handling this cross-examination, is her very generous use of the word, I don't know, or I don't remember that. And even in things that you sort of think 
Okay, here's some examples. Here's some examples. <clears throat> she was even cross-examining her, trying to, trying to uh, the defense attorney was trying to walk Jane Doe 3 to, through some of the things she had just said to the DA, right? Which is a, a very um, excruciatingly mind-numbing process of like, the DA said this and you said this. Do you remember that? And Jane Doe be like, no, I don't remember that. Now, she's not saying, I didn't say that. She's saying, I don't remember. I don't remember that. Yeah. It, almost like if you say that I said it, then I guess I said it. I'm not contesting I said it. Yeah. I'm just telling so, you, I don't remember. <laughs> the, attor the attorney's trying to set up what, what's, uh, what's called an impeachment. Um, and you can only get an impeachment if somebody makes an admission and then you have a transcript or a recording or some other... Um, some other means to show that the person uh, changed their answer now from what it was earlier. So do you remember when the DA asked you um, uh, what color the sky was and you said the sky is blue? Well, a day and a half ago, I was asked that question. I've been asked 733 questions since then. I don't maybe that conversation likely occurred, but I can't conclusively tell you whether or not the conversation occurred. As opposed to, do you remember the DA asking you and you said blue? And I said yes. And she says, actually, I have a transcript from yesterday and you said yellow. It's pretty obvious that is what she's trying to get the Jane Doe to do is to say that she said something and then contradict her that you said something else. Yep. And because Jane Doe 3 just keeps saying, I don't remember. Uh, Sean, how, she can't do anything with it. She's just stimmied. Um, now if the Jane Doe three just keeps saying, I can't remember anything and everything and everything, then may, perhaps the jury is going to be like, well, you seem to really specifically remember the things that matter, but you don't remember anything else. Like I can see there might be a line beyond which the jury might go, eh, this might be affecting your credibility. But up yep. until now, the way she's doing it, even though I'm saying that she's been doing it a lot, it's still in a very believable way, especially since the first time round. She got lit up on cross-examination for not having told everything and everything there was to tell in her very first interview, like the very first interview that she ever gave to the Austin police. She didn't understand that from that point on, she was basically going to be defending her, her life. Like if she ever said a detail later that she didn't say in the first interview, now all of a sudden it was going to be, oh, you must be making it up. And it's like, wait a second. I never guaranteed that just because I sat down with an interview and answered some questions that that was anything and everything there ever was to know about all of this. And okay, so my point being, because she's already had some bad experiences, she is being very careful and literal and accurate and and honest and saying look i don't want to tell you i remember something if it might be a missed memory i just she's almost been apologetic like i'm sorry i just yeah. don't know specifically and she does actually keep saying i'm sorry look i'm really sorry i just don't specifically remember and there have been many times where she'll show her the transcript and say and and, and she'll read it to herself right just not out yeah. loud but to herself and then Sean Holly will say, okay, did that refresh your memory? And she'll go, no, yeah. I don't remember saying I you're reading it here and I'll, I'll grant that it says that I said it. So I probably did, but I'm not going to tell you that I remember saying it. Yeah. And I go, that's an honest answer. It is. And so that's, that's the exact way an impeachment works. If a witness says, I don't remember, then you hand them a document, a written transcript or some other verified method of transcription. Um, and you say, you know, or it could even be a letter. Do you remember the letter you wrote? I don't. Well, read this letter. Did you write this letter? Right. It's a, it's a standard procedure. In fact, it's the correct procedure. And attorneys are sort of counting on a witness to say, yeah, I remember writing that. I remember saying that. But when the witness says, I don't know, the attorney stuck with the answer. There's no other way to impeach. And I want to explain to the viewers that although this, I mean, this is as lawyer a thing as it gets. There is a difference between I don't know and I don't remember slash I don't recall. Mm. I don't recall slash I don't remember means I don't remember today, but at some point I did. I don't know means I don't know it now and I never have. I don't know how to do nuclear physics, but I used to know the citation of the Ghostbusters house conveyance case in New York state. Like I don't remember the, the case name, but I remember that I studied it. I've never known how to do nuclear physics. Never will. I don't do math. I do math on my fingers. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, um, and, and one thing that struck me is because I remember reading this type of testimony. It might have even been from Jane Doe 3 in the last trial. It comes across differently when you're reading it than it does when you're seeing it live. Because honestly, when you're reading it, it sounds like she's being intentionally difficult. It sounds like she's playing dumb. It sounds like she's saying she doesn't know things she really should know when you're just reading the words on the page. But when you see her and you see how you hear her and you see her live and how she's handling it and that she's almost apologetic. She's like, I don't, she's like, this whole thing has been so traumatic for me. Like there was only one entire, um, uh, she was being questioned about a whole section of testimony she gave in the last uh, trial. And she goes, look, I was having an out of body experience during that entire time. I don't remember a single thing I said. And you could tell she was being genuine. Yeah. And it's like, what do you do with that? You can't. And that's one of the reasons I say, I just genuinely don't think Sean Holly has scored a, a single point in the game of impeaching this witness and her credibility. Yeah. So I will. So the, the psychology on this is fairly clear. I'm not a psychologist, but I've hired a bunch of psych experts over the years to provide um, opinions and mental health treatment, and whatever. Anytime we have a major emotional event happen in our life, we tend to not remember the finite details of it. Of course, this was a traumatic event. I've never had that kind of trauma. I've been married 10 years and I can remember my wedding, but I don't remember what my best man talked about in the in my toast. I don't remember, you know, outside of my immediate friends and family. I don't remember who all was there. I certainly don't remember who was invited. Right. I, I couldn't tell you what time it started. And I was there for the whole thing. Right. That just because the, the you, there's there's so much stimuli, there's so much emotional connection to the event, good or bad, that our brain pro struggles to store that in the long term memory and have accurate recall of some of it. Yeah. So, you know, we discussed earlier how the opening statements, um, you know, at least to an observer um, seem to go on for too long for both sides. I mean, if your goal is to hold the attention and interest of the people that you're talking to, uh, it seemed to go on for too long. I can tell you that one of the ways I was explaining away, again, just as a layman, that it's fine. It's fine if they're losing the jury here on both sides, is that they're going to make up for it later. And so I ask you this. This sort of never-ending cross-examination of mind-numbing small issues, to me, it seems like eventually you're losing the game. Like, I know you're saying they can't just do nothing, but I go eventually aren't you just showing the jury that you don't have anything and you seem a little desperate like how would you how would you manage the strategy on this and, and I, I think that's a, i think it's a fair question um she has to do something but you're absolutely right at a point you start to lose the jury because these finite points and for some juries are enormous and some of these finite points in some juries they couldn't care less. Do you know, since you're there, are the jurors taking notes? Are they allowed to have some sort of note taking device or is it just what they observe? They all have little notepads. I can tell you that I have seen almost none of them using them. It doesn't mean like it's possible they're out of my view and I can't tell, but I feel like if they were looking down, writing notes, I could see, I don't see jurors looking down. Yeah, I see. Most, I don't see them being used. Yeah, most jurors don't take a ton of notes. Each court does it differently in Oklahoma. Most jurors are not allowed to take notes, um, in, in, at least in none of the cases that I've tried. They have certainly not in federal court as well. Um, some some judges in this case, they're allowing notebooks. Some judges say you can only take notes about what you observe um, contemporaneous to the observation. So you can take notes about what you're seeing, but you can't go back, say, during the lunch break and write down all of your thoughts after the fact. So I don't know exactly what the rules and limitations on the on the on the jury are, but certainly doesn't appear to be a significant amount of note taking. If there was, it would be, well, maybe she's winning some of these smaller minute points. But if we're not seeing a ton of activity by the jury, getting their heads down, trying to take some some notes on this stuff. I, I, I think having not been there, I agree with you, probably not making just a ton of headway there. Right. OK, let's tackle some questions here. Dustin H says, what would a person experience if they went to the Scientology area of Clearwater and just hung around harassment, recruitment, left alone? You would be left alone. Uh, they don't actually recruit people in downtown Clearwater because you can't actually join Scientology at the flag land base, believe it or not. And most of those restaurants downtown, uh, they're owned. Like when I say restaurant, I mean, a pizza place, uh, a coffee shop, whatever. 
almost all of them are owned by non-Scientologists, even though their landlords are Scientologists. So you can go to downtown Clearwater and uh, the Scientologists will actually ignore you. So I, I say go ahead and, and go down there. Uh, okay, Megan Rarodi. Hello, guys. What is the maximum penalty that Danny will receive? What do y'all think he will receive? Aaron, do you think this is the unraveling of Scientology? So if Danny is convicted on all three counts, he faces a minimum of 45 years in prison. Uh, it's 45 years to life is what he will be facing. Aaron, I think I lost you. Hold on, guys. Let's see if I can get a hold of you. Well, we try to get Aaron back. I mean, I'm watching in the, the chat here. Joe, somebody, would it be bad a bad idea for Aaron to take a photo of Danny or film him? Yeah, it's generally uncouth. You certainly can't take photos in the courthouse or in the courtroom. Although, you know, walking out in public, Danny um, is, is free to have his photo taken without reservation. Um, looks like Aaron's going to try and jump back in here. I'll try to keep this going. Uh, I'm going to roll up and grab some of the, the last super chat he had here. I don't have the, the software to throw it on the screen, but I think I can just uh, read it. Let's see. Can't go all the way up. Oh, it's still here, I guess. Uh, so the maximum, the, it's, so it's what's called a minimum mandatory. Be 45 years in prison. Um, carries a maximum penalty of life, although it would not be life without parole. Life sentences often don't actually mean life without parole. They mean for the natural life of the inmate. Um, for a period of time. So in Oklahoma, for example, a life sentence is a minimum of 45 years. You could go longer at 45 years. You're eligible for parole after you serve 80% of that or 85% of that. You're eligible for partner parole consideration. Doesn't automatically mean um, that you're going to get it. Hard to know what he's going to receive. Uh, I'm not sure if California is a jury sentence state or a judge sentence state. Generally, it's broken down into two categories. We know that he's going to receive a minimum of 45 years. Uh, and it could be a, what, a, a single sentence conviction, which means the sentence is 45 to life. He's going to be locked up for at least 45 years and maybe life. Um, and, but at, starting at 45 years, he would theoretically be uh, subject to the partner parole board. We kept the discussion going in your absence. The hotel internet decided to reset on me. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you for keeping the dream alive. Um, has this answer been uh, question been answered? I, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, for... the, the, the only thing I specifically did not address was the unraveling of Scientology. I addressed the maximum penalty and then what I think he's going to receive and, and how I, I don't have an opinion on that. And I explained why. But, um, you know, you know more about the inner workings of the organization. So I'll leave you that last one there. Yeah, this will not be the unraveling of Scientology, but uh, that will come later. So thank you so much, Megan Rarodi. All right, uh, Travis Bowman, any update on Claire's dad actually testifying? Given his non-expert expertise, how can the court actually recognize him as an expert? It's a great question. I can tell you this. There's no update because uh, even in the last trial, the defense had a list of witnesses and I think even an expert witness, and they just called none of them. Uh, and that's when their witnesses were actually decent, appropriate witnesses. They were just like, nah, we're going to pass. Um, I, I, so we won't know until the defense uh, rests their case yep. that uh, whether they're going to call them or not. So, well, and I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, knowing what we now know about the last trial, that was a pretty good strategic decision on behalf of the defense. Um, I don't care how good your witness is on direct examination. I don't, you could be the best witness ever. Can you hold up to cross examination? Everybody who says, oh, I can hold up to cross-examination is a liar. Cross-examination <laughs> is a brutal process because if you, you can, you're trying to outthink the attorney, but the attorney, if they're doing their job, they're not asking questions chronologically. They'll set a trap, ask 20 questions that are unrelated, and then come back and tighten the noose uh, around the ankle on the trap they set 20 questions ago. Uh, now, as to the second part of this question, his non-expert expertise, how, how can the court recognize him as an expert? There's a whole set of rules, uh, a whole set of rules in the evidence code uh, that address expert witnesses. It's the 700 series. So rule 700 or rule 701, 702, 703, 704, et cetera. It has to do um, 
with uh, their qualifications. And it's also possible that Claire's dad, if her stepdad, I actually think is who it is, but if he's called to testify, it likely would not actually be in an expert capacity. It would be as a character witness to undermine the testimony of Claire. Any witness can be called to uh, challenge the character or fitness of another witness, regardless of their expert status. So if he were to testify, it would likely, in my opinion, not be in an expert as an expert on the Church of Scientology, but rather, here's why Claire doesn't know what she's talking about. Here's the, all the bad things that are wrong with her, whatever. The reality of it is, and Aaron, you addressed this in another video, he's not going to hold up to cross-examination. Right, 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 right. Okay, um, Megan says Zach's YouTube channel could be called Your Lawyer Friend Zach Morgan. I like that. I may have to adopt that. It was musings of a madman, but there's too many of those out there already. So I'm going to have to call it something else. I like that. <laughs> uh, okay. Aro Louise K. Is the jury allowed to talk amongst themselves about trial stuff when court is not in session? That's the judge name. gives an admonition and Aaron, they may give the judge may actually give it while you're in there before the jury retires. My admonition to you is do not discuss this case amongst yourselves or with any other person. Do not read any media, including newspapers, print or video media, social media, the Internet. Do not do any outside research on this case. If anybody comes up and tries to talk to you about the case, let myself or any of my staff know immediately. We'll address that. That should be something similar to the admonition they give every time the jury's retired. Yeah, she gave that in the first place, and she just says the admonition still stands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sidetracks for Super Sticker. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. How do you say this? Sineca. Seneca? I think it's Seneca. It's probable that Graham Brewer's intent was intimidation. The Jane uh, was intimidation of the Jane Doe that he molested. Would informing the DA or the court of his previous relationship with that witness have any bearing on his ability to be in the courtroom? It doesn't because the DA already knows. Yep. So if there's no charge now, it, he could be under investigation, but if there's no pending charges and there's no protective order entered against him, he can be anywhere he wants to, whenever he wants to be there, as long as it's a public place. Yep. Okay. Sue Allen says, did the prosecution object to the repeated, seemingly irrelevant questions from the defense? Well, it's not that they were irrelevant. They were relevant to the testimony that was given. I just thought they were pointless. Like I thought they wasn't, wasn't getting them where they wanted to go. It was kind of busy. So no, there actually weren't, uh, there weren't that many objections today. And I'd say half of them were sustained. Half of them um, were overruled. The judge herself was actually intervening quite often today, um, which I know she doesn't like to do. Um, but she, she intervened almost to protect the Jane Doe. Like if, if a question was asked, but this was both on the prosecution and on the defense. And the judge didn't like what it was going to require the Jane Doe to do. She would actually jump in and say, rephrase it to say something like this or something like this, make it more narrow, you know, and even giving examples of what would be acceptable ways of making it more narrow. It was just really cool to see her like, yeah. you go, wow, she is paying attention to every yeah. single word. It and that's a judicial philosophy. Those who follow like, you know, Supreme Court nominations or something on TV, one of the most often one of the most often asked questions is what is your judicial philosophy? Um, and that's that's true at every level. There are judges who say attorneys advocate, advocates advocate. I'm going to sit back and let you do your job. That's very similar to uh, Justice Thomas. I'm not talking about the politics, but rather his judicial philosophy. And then there's some judges who are super active. They ask every question they can. Judges will actually sustain their own objections to certain things because it clearly violates the rules of evidence. Um, but it, I, I digress a little bit in re direct response to the question here. Um, it's really quite difficult to win an objection on cross-examination. Hmm. It's fairly simple to win an objection on the right legal basis on direct, you know, lack of foundation, you know, um, uh, tell me what you know about Scientology. Well, I object. They haven't laid a foundation. Then you lay a foundation. Uh, were you in Scientology? How did you get in? What is your background? So, okay, so now you're qualified to talk about it. Now I ask you about it, right? Those are fairly simple to win. It's really hard to win an objection on cross-examination because you can, there's no, you can ask leading questions. You can ask hypotheticals. You can lay inferences and you, you hear leading questions all the time. You would agree with me, would you not? Or you would agree with me, wouldn't you, that? And, you know, this happened to Jane Doe. No, I can't agree with that. So you disagree with me? No, I don't know either way. Right. I'm not saying yes. I'm not saying no. But they right. asked that leading question and they put they put the uh, uh, onus on the witness to yeah. uh, fight the assumption. Yeah, we saw a lot of that today. 
wouldn't you agree that it would be reasonable for me to conclude that? And then it was just like, no, I wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's really fun. It's really fun to listen to this stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Jackie Hall gives a super sticker. Thank you, Jackie Hall. Destiny Salazar. Aaron, do you feel this trial is an opportunity to provide the world some insight into the mindset of the church of Scientology? It's, it's an excellent opportunity to do so. And it's one of the reasons um, I'm covering the trial as closely as I am. I want the, the testimony from the Jane Doe's of how they were dealt with by Scientology officials with respect to such a horrible series of crimes is a perfect opportunity to provide insight into the mind of the Church of Scientology. So um, thank you for the question in the super chat. Uh, let's see, Andrew Humphrey, any objections on cross? Yeah, I mean, there were some, and, and they were mostly, you know, 50-50. Um, it was a, a very civil proceeding today. There was no, nothing got heated, nothing got elevated. It was actually quite refreshing to see how friendly the uh, both the deputy DA, um, 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 uh, Mueller and Ariel Anson, the very friendly, at least with Sean Hawley. I don't see them getting all friendly with Philip Cohen, but he might not just be a friendly guy. I just don't even know. But when, you know, when the proceedings are paused, they're very friendly with each other, which I don't know. Some, somehow I found that very, very refreshing. Is that is that pretty common? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. You know, there's times that. Um, you know, I was, I had a, a jury trial and the opposing counsel was actually a good friend of mine from law school. Um, and she kept interrupting my client. So I finally objected. We had a sidebar. I said, judge, I'm objecting that she won't let my client finish the, uh, finish the answer. If she doesn't like the answer, she can object or as non-responsive or ask the question again. I can't even hear the answer. And then she moved on. And when we took a lunch break, she, the, the lady came over to my table. She I was wondering how long you're going to let me get away with it. I mean, it's not, it's just. For the parties, it's extremely intense. And in the moment for the attorneys, it's extremely intense. But the attorneys just when when the lights are off and the jury's out, it's just a job. Yeah, it's true. All right, Shy Town Native, do uh, do you do you want to react when something funny or irritating happens during this trial? A Aaron, how do you contain yourself? You know, the, there have been times when the court, uh, the gallery has reacted not not so much that the judge has to be like order order in the court but you know in, in some ways she runs a very very strict court but in other ways she's a, a very caring human being and how she deals with everyone like she you know it's not like she rules with an iron fist like she controls her business but she's actually very nice overall so i guess what i'm saying here is that um i feel it would be very unprofessional for me to act in a way that was not in accordance with how everyone else was acting. So, um, and, and it, I mean, come on, it's not like stuff's happening in the trial. That's so funny that I can't, you know, get, get, you know, not laugh or something like that. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it had, I have not struggled with this, I guess is my simple answer to this question. Shibaka Wookie. Sean is a great lawyer. This is Sean Holly, but she might as well be, for amber turd the best she can hope for is another mistrial go buy yourself a starbucks with this well thank you very much i think it's true i think the best they can hope for is another mistrial there's no way they're going to unanimously found find danny masters and not guilty i mean that's my prediction and i think i mean someone asked me today how do you think it's going i said i think they're doing the best you could hope for the problem is you never know what's happening in the minds of the jury all it takes is one juror who just really doesn't like women all that much and you're screwed and we just don't know. And that's the nature of the jury system. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've had juries come back and I liked, I liked my jury. I liked the feeling I got and they've come back and handed me a big fat zero. I've looked at that going, man, I left so much evidence in this courtroom that I'm just kicking myself and they come back and I got to check with, you know, two commas in it kind of deal. Yeah. So um, I do think it's going well. Um, as I say that, I, I just have to remind myself, I thought it went well last time. So I'm just trying to give my honest feedback on all this stuff and, uh, you know, be cautiously optimistic, but not be too hopeful, not create false expectations or false hopes. But I really do think that it's going very well so far. Um, hey, hey, for the folks in the question, in the, in the chat. If you if you if you're not if you're not putting out a super chat, make sure you start it with question in all caps. It's easier for Aaron to grab as he's scrolling through there. Totally. 
Okay, let's take the next one. Abel S. Zach, official SPTV correspondent as of tonight. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time we're doing this since we started calling this SPTV. So this is great. I really wish you had a channel up and running, man. What's going uh, on? Well, I got I got a couple of I got a couple of major projects for work. I'm trying to get finished up, and then okay. hopefully it's something I'll be able to get into this summer and get it all set up. Okay. Um. So wait. So in that. Uh, well, here we go. So wait. When I paused, I was the only one who paused. Like you. Yeah. You're... Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's because we're on separate internet connections. Thank God. I thought it was you who paused. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I so I've got you on one screen, I've got the YouTube feed on the other, and there's a delay. Uh huh. So when I saw you freeze and then I stayed live on the YouTube, I was like, all right, I guess I'll run the show for a while. We'll see what happens. So did it kick me out, or was I just stuck there frozen? Like you were stuck there frozen, but then it eventually backed you out. Okay. And then it was just it was me full screen, and then uh, the uh, lower third that you'd thrown with the with the YouTube question was it just stayed up. So okay, cool. Yeah, Cat and Maggie says the facial expression on that pause while Zach, Zach calmly takes over. I love it. Thank God. Um, okay, let's see. Valerie. I, I used to fly airplanes for a living. So when things break, you just figure out what to do next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Valerie Boljack, do Sea Org members know of this case? No. Sea Org members live in a bubble. They do not know about any Scientology litigation that's going on unless Scientology, unless the people on the financial planning committee for the various organizations are having to allocate a certain amount of money each week to fund that lawsuit, which is the case when I was in the Sea Org every week, we were setting aside money for the Reed Slatkin lawsuit. Um, otherwise the Sea Org members will not know of this case. There'll be some people at celebrity center, of course, some people at OSA, of course, but your general rank and file Sea Org members will not. Uh, Jessica Ozier, Ozier, Ozier. Hey, hey, Ron, I go into withdraws if I don't see at least two of your videos per day. Oh, there we go. It's pronounced like, well, I don't know how to pronounce Dozier either. <laughs> it's very possible that it's Ozier. I grew up with the, I grew up near a family whose last name was Dozier, so it could very well be Dozier. Ozier. Dozier, Dozier or Dozier? It was, it was Dozier, like, like, Dozier. like Dozier. Yeah, okay, yeah. Jessica Osier. Okay, keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Jessica. And I'm committed to at least four videos per day. That is SPTV required output. Uh, Rural SD Lawyer, first time ever Church of Scientology Live showed up in my YouTube feed tonight. Oh, my God. Well, there you go. I mean, eventually, YouTube is just going to think that you just want Scientology content. And they're at least going to send it off to you. But, uh, you know, I... Uh, the click through rate on Scientology, like Scientology's own, like or homegrown content, must be so low. Like you go to their YouTube channel and you go to their videos. Some of their videos, there's the ones that they promote and have millions of views, and the other ones have like 16 views. They have like no organic reach on the Scientology channels. Uh, okay, so this is Janine Greider, my first ever super chat, my first super chat ever. Congratulations, Janine. Welcome to the chat, and um, thank you for making your first ever super chat. I love how you aren't bothered by anything Scientology does to you. Yeah, I do too. There's probably something wrong with me, to be perfectly honest, but um, it's a personality flaw I make uh, good use of. <laughs> uh, Gia Falcone, any thoughts on why this is getting so little media coverage? It was in the LA Times, you know. I this is I can I can tell from at least in where I live in my part of the country. It's getting picked up by um, national, local, na local affiliates to national news. The the uh, the last time they tried this, Harvey Weinstein was on trial, same floor down the hall. Right. So you know that's that's a main that's a mainstream celebrity. This is a B minus C list celebrity at best at his prime. So when the courthouse is more quiet, these cases are going to carry a higher profile. Last time he was trying to compete with Harvey Weinstein. It's true. I mean, there was a a gang murder trial going on more people were showing up for that trial than are showing up for for danny masterson trial uh and now that that trial's over i i mean I, i'm entering and i'm entering the courtroom during peak rush hour traffic and i i fly right through security it just has to do with danny masterson is not a big celebrity that's the answer um and scientology's interesting but not interesting enough to take the day off to go downtown and spend some hours in a courtroom for most people <clears throat> okay let's see share 
Matthews. Question, comment, responding to your earlier chat, I won a similar civil trial as the Janes. There were three other witnesses that had the same horrific abuse as me. The truth is we never discussed details with each other. Yeah, uh, Zach, you probably heard me say um, that today. It's like I'm, I, I'm a chatty Kathy. I want to know everything. I want to know all the nitty details. And I'm also, I'm, I'm also chatty. I, mm -hmm. I freely share details. So um, I have this response from Cher. I've seen a similar response in the comments section today of saying people who are victims of these crimes don't necessarily relish sharing the details with other victims. It's enough just to sort of be there, say, I believe you, I support you you know, and, and that kind of stuff. So it's interesting. It's just, uh, it's just, um, I guess I was just approaching it from, from my perspective and, and maybe the jurors aren't wondering why people wouldn't ha have spoken about it. So um, we'll see. Thank you. I appreciate the super chat. Carrie says, depending on the outcome, can the Jane Doe's then sue Scientology for not reporting to the authorities? The answer here is a little bit probably a surprise to some. You can sue anybody for any reason in this country. The question should not be, can anybody sue anybody else or anything else? The answer is, if I sue something else, somebody or something, will I win? So the actual answer to your question is yes, absolutely. I think what you're asking is, would a lawsuit against the, the Church of Scientology be successful? And I, I can't speak specifically. I think there may already be some litigation pending on this that's been stayed as a result of the Masterson case, because yeah. regardless of the verdict in the criminal case, once there's no more appeals and there's no more mistrials, once the, the final matter is adjudicated, yeah, the lawsuit will proceed. But it is stayed right now because right now Masterson should and would take the Fifth Amendment if subpoenaed uh, or asked to uh, given an instruction to give a deposition. After this trial is adjudicated, whether he is uh, convicted or acquitted, he no longer gets Fifth Amendment protection because even if he if he admits under oath that he did what he did, he can't be retried. As soon as the jury is impaneled, the, 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 the jeopardy attaches and the protection is double jeopardy says you can't be criminally tried for the same same case twice. So uh, I believe there's already litigation pending. And so the actual answer is yes. I don't know what the outcome would be. It'll take a while. So the litigation that's pending is a civil suit for the harassment that occurred since 2016, not for anything about failing to report. That civil suit will will resume once this criminal trial is over. Yeah. Carrie, my best answer to this question is that all the current legal decisions have supported the enforceability of Scientology's arbitration agreements that prevent Scientologists from suing Scientology. There's nothing we've learned in this case. There's nothing that's come up. There's no decisions that have been made that would impact the enforceability of Scientology's arbitration agreements. It would be a total Hail Mary to sue Scientology for this reason. I don't think any attorney would, would take that on personally. Uh, okay, Sue Prov. Would high-profile Scientology members like Tom Cruise or John Travolta be aware of this trial? He, I, I, John Travolta doesn't read the internet. Um Tom Cruise is pretty sheltered from stuff like this. I'll tell you, my gut response is yes, but um, I'll ask Mike and Mark for their opinions uh, later on. Oliver Peterson, would we increase the chances of winning the case if we all pray to Xenu tonight? Just wondering. Well, you can do whatever you want, you know. Uh, pray to whatever God you believe in, even if that God is Xenu. <laughs> Jeffrey Augustine did Zach have to file pro hack vice to appear on STP TV in Cali? So it's actually, it's a Latin phrase. It actually is pronounced pro hoc vice. Um, pro, oh. what it, <laughs> so we, we shorten and call it pro hoc. Oh, I'm admitted pro hoc. Uh, it, what it means is I, since I'm not admitted to practice in California, I could file it, but I could file an application to be admitted pro hoc vice for this matter only. And I would have to associate with local council. So it's sort of a, Based on the profile picture, I, I looks perhaps this individual may be involved in the legal field in some capacity. So it's probably a little bit of inside baseball there. There we go. Uh, Mark Headley says, Aaron, Zach took over like a boss when your internet body thetans took over. Well, thank God. I mean, I literally thought the stream was down. I was like, I was like, oh my God, the whole thing's been sabotaged. Damn you, Miscavige. Mark, I, um, I I appreciate that. The home office for my law firm is actually in Denver. So next time I'm out there, I'll hit you up and we'll go get we'll go grab a beer. 
There you go. All right, Seeker0628. Can charges such as obstruction be brought on Scientology for how the Jane Doe's were handled with not being able to go to the authorities for their attacks? The answer is 100% yes. Uh, there's a grand jury investigation. Uh, is that the right word? A grand jury investigation? Yeah, it's grand jury investigation. Still currently ongoing regarding the obstruction of justice. And I think uh, Scientology will be very lucky to come out of this without some sort of charges. But hey, what do I know, guys? Well, but that's why I've got a lawyer here. What do you think, though? Well, wait, uh, it, it seems that this investigation, how long can a grand jury investigation go on for? I'm a little confused about this. As long as it takes. Really? So, yeah. So a, a grand jury is just so different states do it different ways in Oklahoma. So in Oklahoma, you can be charged either through just an information where you're arrested and charged and then you have a probable cause hearing or you have a, a, a preliminary hearing or like in the federal system, you can be charged via indictment where a grand jury decides, is there enough evidence to bring charges against you? And that's essentially what an impeachment is in Congress. When the president is impeached by the House of Representatives, he's indicted under allegations of criminal wrongdoing. The trial court is the Senate. It's the same sort of thing. So the trial court goes before a district judge or a you know, superior court, circuit judge, whatever, and then you get a jury. A grand jury doesn't, they, like they don't meet eight to five. They may meet for two or three or four days and then they'll take six or seven weeks off. Hmm. And then they'll take testimony for three or four days. The witnesses generally don't get an attorney. The state is represented by an attorney and the attorney is only asking very specific questions. There's no rules of evidence. There's not even a judge in the room. Grand jury hearings are often held in conference rooms, not courtrooms. I've always wondered about yep. this. And they're, they're sealed. Grand jury proceedings are sealed. They're secret. Leaking of grand jury testimony um, uh, is a felony in most jurisdictions. Like it's that big a deal. And it's just normal citizens, just like regular jury duty. Yeah. But in, rather than subpoenaing or, you know, uh, or sending a jury summons to 5,000 people, they send a jury summons to 20 or 40 or however many sit on the, the grand jury. And so in Oklahoma, we have what's called the multi-county grand jury. So if, for example, the district attorney's office is alleged to have engaged in criminal misconduct, who's going to investigate the DA? Who's the charging officer in that county? The multi-county grand jury would investigate him and could indict him. That way he's not investigating his own crimes. Wow. Amazing. Okay, next one. Richard Richmore. Is it just me or does anyone else find it disgusting that the defense lawyer would represent a client they believe no is guilty? This is a very unpopular opinion that I'm about to give. Okay. I don't find it disgusting because I believe in the protection of constitutional rights. I tell people all the time, I will defend your right to make a bad choice. And I'll even defend you for making that bad choice. And if you view the defense attorney not as somebody who's trying to get a criminal off the hook, but rather as the person who's holding the government to account to make sure it proves its case beyond a reasonable doubt and satisfies all the elements of the charge, a lot of times that'll sort of shift the worldview of the way people uh, uh, view criminal defense attorneys. I don't do a ton of criminal law. I've done some. I don't. It's not. It's never been a large part of my practice. But I, I have a ton of respect for for criminal defense attorneys. Nobody wants the job. When you lose, your client goes to prison. When you win, you're known as the guy who got the murderer or the bad guy off. You don't have a good day. But so it's probably a fairly unpopular opinion. As, and there was even some comments about some comments about this after the chat we did yesterday, last night. Um, it's a fairly unpopular opinion. But that's my opinion is that I don't view these people as bad guys. I view these regardless of whether you think your client did it or not. Your job is to defend your client's constitutional rights and hold the government to account. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay, let's see. Linda NS, can you talk more about confrontation with the Graham guy? Linda, I am going to, but I'm going to give it its own dedicated video so that um, everybody gets a chance to see it. Uh, rural SD lawyer, Scientology live feed tonight. No reactions, one comment. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Andrew Humphrey, Zach, a Boeing 737 captain here. Why didn't you go into aviation law? Wait, I thought you did. I, I did. So I used to I used to be um, uh, as a baby lawyer, I was you know, staff counsel for the FAA reviewing uh, non-citizen trust agreements for foreign airline operations. Uh, but then I went into the litigation side. I've represented airmen in certificate actions, and it's not going to mean much to anybody other than uh, Captain Andrew here. But uh, airmen certificate actions, both for alcohol motor vehicle actions, as well as 9113 and other ops and regulatory violations. 
Uh, I used to uh, I used to have a contract as a regional counsel for Alpa defending uh, DUIs, the criminal aspect of a DUI for airman certificates. Uh, and now I work full time in academia as a collegiate professor in a professional pilot training program. So and I'm, I'm a flight instructor, I'm a, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I do I'm actively involved in aviation and I did a lot of aviation law uh, for a long time. Nice. Okay, so here we go. Have you had any interactions with Tony Ortega? Nope. He's doing his thing. I'm, I'm doing my thing, just as it should be. The world is in balance. Andy Fabulous. The Catholic and Mormon churches were sued for sex crimes. Surely Scientology can be sued as well and get a judgment for the plaintiff. Andy, you'd have to think that eventually something like this would happen. Um, so. Uh, the primary difference is um, so far, the courts have said that the arbitration agreement is valid. There's Aaron and I've had some off the air talks about some of the opportunities in Florida, um, in the, uh, the, with the Australian, uh, labor trafficking case, um, that could change some things. But generally speaking, the Catholic and the Mormon churches, um, although they maybe had some non-disclosure agreements signed as in lieu, uh, at the time of settlement at the time that a member joined the church or joined the clergy, those arbitration agreements didn't exist. And so they were not, they were not banned from the courtroom from a legal perspective. Right, right, right. Okay. This is actually a really interesting comment. Uh, Gia Falcone, Aaron, think how hard it is for you to talk about your trauma with Scientology and how it broke up your family might help you understand a little how the Janes can't talk about having been assaulted the pain and shame run very deep yeah i do get that i i think i'm i am I'm, I'm i'm coming around to understanding that so that, that's a good comment thank you uh youth canoe i i know why this cracks me up so much because it sounds like douche canoe which is an insult mark headley loves to use <laughs> Okay, Youth Canoe saw Danny Masterson New York Times article and they mentioned Claire Headley. Look at Claire making headlines worldwide. Uh, I can't wait for her to testify. Um, I, I'm very much looking forward to being here for Claire's testimony. It's going to be amazing. Uh, Carrie, if Scientology is convicted of obstruction, will that cause a problem with or affect their tax exempt status? If not, what charges would? So, Carrie, my understanding is that any criminal prosecution um, – uh, or, or, you know, c conviction, I should say, of, of felonies. It doesn't automatically trigger a revocation of the tax exempt status, but it sure gives the IRS a good justification to revisit the matter. And I think the IRS needs a good justification because, you know, Scientology is going to be fighting for its life and they're going to fight really hard. So it can't just be we woke up this morning and decided to revisit the issue. It needs to be something very, very serious. I, honestly, something like, you know, obstructing justice in a rape thing. I don't think that rises to the level of IRS revisiting tax exemption. I think when you talk about widespread tens of millions of dollars of credit card fraud and wire fraud, and uh, that's the kind of stuff that I think uh, I personally believe the government and the IRS is going to care more about. And I think we're going to see, I believe we will see um, indictments along those lines in the next several years. Uh, within the next several years. Okay, Destiny Salazar. So glad that Zach is here to drop all of this knowledge. Yeah, this is fun. We have a good time. Tarkina Meyer. Zach, is there a reason they don't show the police photos like they do for the Scientology people? Yes, that's what we were going to ask you about too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so you know, in the slide deck, um, you know, uh, there, there's a there's like an LED screen above the witness stand and they put the photos up of the Sea members as they're being talked about but they don't do it for the officers. I have found it to be very confusing, especially since the three officers all have names uh, that to like a gringo Vargas like and me. Reyes. Yeah. Vargas, Reyes, um, um, Myers. It's all the freaking same, dude. Yeah. Why, so, why don't they show the cops photos? Because the Scientology people, they're not going to call as witnesses. The police will come sit in the box. Say that again. The, the uh, Scientology folks will not be called as witnesses. The police oh, right. officers are going to come sit in the box and testify. That's true. They are. So rather than showing you this person you're going to see in 10 days, I'm, I'm, we're going to mention Joe Bob's name 57 times, but you're never going to see him because he's hiding behind the walls of the church. So uh -huh. this is what he looks like. So when I say Joe Bob, you have an idea in your head. But when I call the detective, they're going to sit in the stand. But these detectives have already been mentioned 100 times, and we don't know what they look like, and it's confusing. Is there a rule against not showing? No. Th there isn't a rule? Hmm. No. Uh, police – now – 
there are exceptions. There's no absolutes. A lawyer who tells you always or never is going to get himself sued. But um, mm -hmm. there are general rules like uh, first off, they're government employees. Right. They're working for a municipality um, in, a, in a law enforcement capacity. If there's an undercover officer, if it is uh, the FBI have these special agents called ghost agents who sort of don't exist outside the world, outside their mission. Um, occasionally they'll testify behind a screen or in a mask or they'll put a, the, a microphone with a voice modulator on it because they may be actively working undercover, or actively working a sting operation, but they had to come to court. In that case, that's different, but that's certainly not the case here. Detectives are fairly well known. Hmm. Very interesting. All right, everybody. Well, Zach, 2,500 people watching live might be a record for one of our streams. <laughs> We're getting better. That's pretty wild. Um, I think we got up to 3,500 on the last Mondays with Mike and Mark that we did. So 2,500 for just a, a Wednesday evening stream is pretty fantastic. Um, well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, we're always learning. Uh-oh, Valerie's jumping in here. Uh, remember, the straw and the camel. This won't be the end of Scientology, but another straw. Straws matter. There you go. Straws do matter. Um, great. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We're going to do this again tomorrow. We're going to do it again on Friday. We're going to do it again next Monday and Tuesday, and we'll see what happens after that. So uh, uh, get yourself a YouTube thing that we can promote. Zach, come on now. <laughs> I've, I've, got a, I've got a couple of uh, work deals, and once we get that finished, we'll get after it this summer. We'll try to have something up for you soon. All right, cool. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Talk to you soon. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, 